Greetings, everyone. Today, we're covering the Neptune project and our efforts to get it on the air. This is a series about the initial and incomplete Simulink model and how to convert it to HDL, or hardware description language, using MATLAB's HDL coder toolbox. Open Research Institute offers MATLAB, Simulink, and all other toolboxes for anyone who wants to do open source digital communications, where most of our work is prototyped or intended for deployment on amateur radio bands. Neptune is an OFDM data link for drones, aeronautics, and aerospace. Uh, the specification and all work shown here is available at our repository shown here. If you want to get involved, please visit the website and join one of our teams. Assuming you have an account at Remote Lab West, then please log in as Matt or Kuropi. This machine is connected to the Neptune hardware and has the MATLAB Simulink license. If you'd like to read more about Remote Labs, please visit this repository. So let's begin. Here's our screen after a successful login to Matt. We'll go ahead and start one of our instances of MATLAB from our tools directory. In this case, we're using R2023A. If it doesn't happen automatically, then we'll go ahead and need to add our folders to the path, including all subdirectories. We navigate to where we clone the Neptune repository. That's where the files we're working on this project come from. Each individual developer needs to clone their own repository and set up their own credential manager for GitHub. Use your name in the directory containing the cloned repo to show who's doing what. Here, I'm working in Neptune as Abraxas 3D. I've gone ahead and cloned the Neptune directory from ORI GitHub, and I've added this directory to the path, where I'll go ahead and open the files. Open up to ofdm.m. The top section is an introduction, with the section section being an example straight from one of the reference books we have used to learn about OFDM. This is a simple example with uh, just a few input tones. The third section is Neptune mandatory specification, which is the 20 megahertz section of the spec. The specification is in the repository. The fourth section loads the pre-calculated MATLAB workspace variables and uh, opens the Simulink model. Using the pre-calculated values from the included workspace, you have about 15 minutes of compute time on Kuropi. If the Neptune section needs to be updated, then the save workspace will be updated. You can run any part of the script if you want to, but we have it set up to where you don't have to. Dividing the MATLAB script into sections lets us run the sections individually. To get things rolling, all we need to do here is click Run Section after highlighting the fourth section with the Load and Open System commands. After running the section, the workspace variables appear in the workspace window on the right-hand side of the MATLAB IDE. With the section running, we'll go ahead and see the workspace variables will pop up on the window to the right. And the Simulink model opens. MATLAB is text-based and scripted. Simulink is block diagrams or flow diagrams. In the Simulink window, we run the model by clicking Run. An important thing in the slide to note is the stop time. It's 10 times 1 over 20,000. This works out to 10 symbol periods worth of simulation time. The OFDM symbols come out at a rate of uh, 20 kilohertz. After the model is run, we see colorful changes in the model. Each of these colors correspond to a different clock rate. In the Debug tab, under Information Overlays, go ahead and click Timing Legend to get a helpful screen that tracks timing information. For digital circuits, this is super handy. Here's what the window should now look like. The symbol library has been opened up to and is on the left. For HDL coder, the toolbox that turns Simulink model into HDL code, it's very important to use only the blocks in the HDL coder library. This will make this process as easy as possible. There are a wide variety of blocks. Custom MATLAB code can go into the blocks as well. Uh, so far, all the blocks we've needed are in the HDL coder library. The timing legend has two modes. Click the 1 slash P button to switch between frequency and period. Let's go through the blocks. Here's a constant. This becomes the valid input data control signal for the IFFT block. Next here's unbuffer. 
This nifty little block is going to turn our constant into scalar samples at the proper rate. Uh, we aren't doing anything fancy here, but you could set the constant to an array of binary values with an occasional zero to exercise the data valid function. The other input to the IFFT is two sine waves added together. Here we create a sampled sine wave. Note the sample sine wave is 1 over 20,480,000. This comes from the mandatory 20 megahertz section of the specification. Here we create another sine wave at a different frequency. We sum the sine waves with the sum block. Use blocks compatible with HDL coder throughout, even though this section is the stimulus for the design and won't be converted with the HDL coder. We'll talk about this more very shortly. Uh, for now, we are creating an input for the IFFT that the sum of the two sampled sine waves. Let's look at the workhorse of our design so far, the IFFT block itself. Here's the parameters. We have uh, 1024 tones going in through this version of Neptune, so the size is 1024. Uh, I believe everything else is left to defaults. Here's another look at the model after we ran it with the IFFT on the left-hand side. If you've noticed those little ovals, those are outport blocks. Outport blocks link signals from a system to a destination outside the system, or can help connect signals flowing from a subsystem to other parts of the model, depending on their hierarchy. They're used well by HDL Coder Slow Model. Here's the second tab of the outport block. Here's the third. You'll see a lot of this. Minus one for sample time, which means the block inherits the sample time flowing to it. Let's talk briefly about visualization of our model. If you click on any connection in the model, you'll see three dots, and from that, you'll find a menu. I'll go ahead and point out here the option to start logging signal or stop logging signal if start logging signal was already selected is quite useful. With a bunch of signals logged, a symbol that looks like a Wi Fi indicator appears faintly by the source of any connector wire that's selected. You can see several here. The simulation data inspector visualizes and compares multiple kinds of data that we tagged. On the simulation tab, under review results, click data inspector. This window will open up. Click the drop down menus on the left hand pane to reveal all the signals that we tagged with logging. Here's the list we had at this point of the design. If a signal has been labeled with a meaningful name, which we do by double clicking on the wire and typing into the text box that pops up, then that name will be here. Otherwise, it might be kind of obscure. Good names for signals are like good names for variables. It's harder than it first seems. When you click the box to the left of the signal name, it gives you some choices in how to display. I chose convert frames because that fits with what I want to see. Click OK to map the data to the grid. Here's what it looks like. This is the time series coming out of the IFFT. We'll want to look at several different signals at once using subwindows. So click Visualizations and go ahead and select something like the 2x2 two two grid. Here's what that looks like. Click on any open window and assign signals to it. You can assign multiple signals to the same window to overlay them pretty easy. Delay is shown directly with the x-axis being time. We can improve things a bit here and name the signals that we've created on the other side. We had x of t on the lower left and x of t with cyclic prefix on the upper right. Refreshing the inspector here, and we can get those better signal names to show up. Another view of our updated choices, and here's the whole window. In the list of signals, if you right-click on the signal, you can highlight it in the model. When the model gets large, uh, this is a quick way to find the signal. Needle in a haystack. Here's the count hit signal in a subpanel of the inspector. 
Every time we count up to 1024, we have reached the end of a Neptune symbol, and we need to insert a cyclic prefix. Another visualization is the scope display. We have it connected to our four signals. Let's see what that looks like. After double clicking on the scope, it opens up like this. We've configured it for two by two view like we had earlier, where we can see the counter countering up and triggering the counter hit the 1014 signal. We can see the sine waves and see series output with the IFFT. Let's look at more blocks in the model now that we've gotten some understanding of how to visualize. We're going to look at the block on the lower right. Now this, this is an HDL counter block. This will generate the triggering signal for insertion of the cyclic prefix. If you happen to be a Simulink expert and know of a better way to do any of this, then please let us know. We love comment and critique and communication with other open source digital radio enthusiasts. Note it counts up to 128 now. We said we wanted it to count to 1024. The reason it's 128 is because the signal it is receiving from the output of the IFFT is coming out as an 8 by 1 vector of values. 8 times 128 is 1024. We are counting 128 batches of 8 by 1 complex doubles. We eventually want something in fixed point, but because we're learning how to do all this and the data is coming from our MATLAB script, uh, we started off with double complex numbers. We make some selections here to where it's unsigned. Word length is 8, step value is 1, and we have a count hit port selected. It starts counting at 0, counts up to 128, and then starts over. You can see the count hit output port here. As long as data is valid from the IFFT, the counter will count. Next up is the deserializer. The start in input is selected, and we can see it in the block here. This start in is connected to the count hit output of the HDL counter. What we're doing with this block is to go from 8 by 1 vectors to 1024 by 1. The ratio parameter is set to 128, with idle cycles set to 0. If you look at the signal sizes in the slide, you can see that we are now dealing with 1024 by 1 vectors. Next up is the select cyclic prefix block. The number of input dimensions is 2, because we have a 1024 row by 1 column. Our index mode is 1 based, because we're in MATLAB. There are multiple index options, but the goal here is to get the last 81 values from the 1024 values that we're dealing with, and then put those 81 values on the front end of the 1024. This produces uh, 1,105 after prepending. You can see that there is an array listing the indices of the first dimension, which is the last 81 rows of the vector. You can see there is a value of 1 for the second index vector, which stands for the single column. Two dimensions, two index vectors. Here is a very specialized block. It knows we have a cyclic prefix and knows we have to prepend it. The number of inputs is given, and you follow the order from top to bottom. We send the prefix to the top, and the entire 1024 values to the bottom port. The resulting vector is the combination of both of those, coming out at the same clock rate. This is still a single OFDM symbol, going out at the symbol rate of 20 kHz. Here's another view of the model so far. There's plenty left to do, so please subscribe to get notifications for this and much more. The highlighted blocks are the circuits doing the work. We call this the device under test. The parts that are not selected are the blocks creating the input symbols or stimulus. We want HDL coder to target just the device under test, and we don't want to include the blocks producing a stimulus. To do this, we create a subsystem that includes only the device under test. This way, we can have a Simulink model with stimulus and things like user interfaces and error checking also enabled. This is also the way we designate the parts we want to convert to HDL. 
Right-click the selection of the device under test and create subsystem from selection. After a bit of rearranging here, we get something like this. We can clearly see the blocks producing the stimulus and control signals. And we can target the big box in the middle as our device under test. Let's go ahead and try that. There's still a lot left to do, but let's see what the HDL Coder Workflow Advisor looks like. Right-click the device under test and select an HDL code, then HDL Workflow Advisor. This will be what that looks like. Now you work from top to bottom in the list in this pane on the left-hand side. There's an explanation of what's generally going on in the first window. The first thing to do is set the target workflow, platform, synthesis tool, and uh, device. There are several options here, but I picked IP core generation to start out. <laughs> and it failed right away. Um, we didn't set our environment variable for Vivado. This is a good stopping point, so we will pick up from here next time. Thank you for everyone that supports our work. If you or someone you know wants to learn about digital communications design for FPGA or ASIC and benefit open source along the way, please consider working with ORI. Thank you all very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.